Welcome to the Talberg Foundation podcast series, New Thinking for a New World. Host Alan Stoga welcomes leaders from around the world to explore the issues that are challenging and changing their societies. From climate change to democracy under siege to geopolitics and beyond, we are looking for ideas that can make all our lives better. As everyone knows, the United States has experienced a traumatic start to 2021. A few weeks ago, rioters encouraged by President Trump invaded the nation's capital, forcing the vice president, senators and congressmen to flee for their lives and interrupting the process of confirming Joe Biden's electoral victory. But the rioters were expelled. Trump has been impeached. President Biden has been inaugurated. However, no one should believe the stresses and strains that produced those extraordinary events have disappeared or that American democracy is now safe. And that includes my guest today, former Speaker of the House of Representatives and Congressman Dick Gephardt. Welcome, Dick, to New Thinking for a New World. Great to be with you. Let me start with a personal question. I know you had warned of the potential for violence if Trump lost, but what were you thinking? What were you feeling when you watched the riot unfold in a place where you had served the nation for almost three decades? Well, it broke my heart. Um, I, I have never been in my whole life as worried as I was on that day, which is kind of the capstone of what had been going on for a long period of time in the country, dividing the country uh, as I was that day. More worried about whether or not we could survive as a democracy. I think we're as divided and in danger of losing the democracy as we were in 1860. And that's a that's a broad, big statement, but that's what I believe. Uh, I've always believed politics or democracy is a substitute for violence, and it can very often get back to almost violence. But January 6th was a time when it went over the top into violence to bring about the change that the protesters wanted. And so it was a it was a inflection point in American history. Uh, I don't think that's overstatement. And it just indicates how much work, how much effort has to go on now to restore this democracy. Politics always and everywhere has been a blood sport. In the United States, I'm thinking about McCarthy, about LBJ hiding a war, about Nixon's enemy list, even assassinations. But as you just said, this feels very different. What is different about today that's bringing out the worst in us? And then that's not just on the far right, uh, but bringing out the worst in the body politic. And that, in your judgment, risks making America a failed democratic experiment. Well, I always have to back up on questions of, uh, like this to kind of my basic beliefs about human nature and democracy. Uh, as I said a minute ago, I think democracy is a substitute for violence. I also believe that our ancestors in 1776 and 1789 decided that they wanted 535 people in the room, that's Congress, not one. That means that every American has to be involved in this experiment of self-government. And that means that every big decision that's made, in effect, mediating the conflicts and differences that people in the country inevitably have, those compromises are really hard. They've always been hard. And politics always can revert to almost violence. And I can give you a lot of examples through our history where, you know, people were almost ready to go to fisticuffs. You know, you had violence in Congress uh, in the Civil War period. You had members of Congress actually cane one another. And in the old days, they'd go outside the, the, the Capitol and, and have duels and shoot one another. So all of that is in our history, and it's in every democracy's history. This is just what to expect. This is hard to do. Uh, but when people say to me, well, why do we do that? Why don't we have one person just make the decisions? It's easier. It's more efficient. I say, well, 
we could do that, and we may be tempted to do that, but you won't like that. Because the majesty of democracy is that after you make those big, tough decisions, the losing side, and I mean by that not just in Congress, but in the country, the people that are uh, holding that position, don't want to leave the country or pick up a rifle. They're willing to grudgingly put up with the result because they believe it was fair or fair enough that their voice was heard, they just didn't win on that vote. And they will have a chance another day to turn it around. That's the majesty of democracy. And I've seen it up close and real on many, many occasions, and I am in awe of what it can do. I also believe that Winston Churchill was right when he said, democracy is the worst form of government on the earth, except for all the others. And he was dead right. So why are we at this point? I think that's the real thing we have to think about and talk about. Why is it worse than it's been? And I can cite you a lot of evidence and reasons. Uh, We know that we had a big recession in 08, and a lot of people were left out and left behind. We know that we're going from an industrial uh, economy to an information economy. And that changes uh, a lot of people's economics and their way of life and their standard of living. And they're worried and concerned about that and on and on and on. I can give you all those reasons. But I think the main problem or challenge we now face is that over the last 30 years, maybe 40 years, We've gone from an information system surrounding politics that has aided and abetted producing an information culture where we have little or no shared facts among the people. If this is self-government of, by, and for the people, and the people have to make basic decisions about who they want to represent them on what particular issues, If there are no shared facts in the country, I don't know how you have a democracy. I think it's that serious. So I can take you back to, you know, uh, the start of negative ads in politics. I lived through that. When I first ran in 1976, nobody ran, ran negative ads. I never even thought of doing a negative ad. And then as time went on, the late 70s, 80s, Then the political consultants convinced all the candidates the only thing that works is negative. So you run negative and your opponent will run negative, and then you got to answer that negative and hit them back harder and blah, blah, blah. The thing I used to say is if Anheuser Busch and Miller Brewery did this with their product, and Anheuser Busch said, you know, Miller beer is poison, you can't drink it. And then Miller would run a counter ad saying Budweiser is poison, you can't drink it. Do you think anybody would buy beer? Of course not. And so we have done this to ourselves. That was the beginning of this trend toward disinformation. Then you put on top of that some legacy channels like Fox with Roger Ailes who figured out, hey, this negative stuff works, so let's make it a propaganda arm of the Republican Party or the conservative side. And then they started pumping out this stuff 24-7, 24-7, 365. And now you've got one of these, like Fox, that are doing the same. And now you have social media platforms on top of it who have a business plan of using algorithms to keep people's attention in an information bubble that they already believe and want to hear more of. And that's why I think we're now at a tipping point in our democracy. To the point, we are where we are. The original sin was to allow the information ecosystem to evolve for a purpose of marketing as opposed to informing and debating. So you get this self-reinforcing bubble because they're trying to sell you Miller or Bud or Chevrolet or whatever, or politicians. And so we live, as you've just said, in these mutually exclusive worlds, all I hear is what I want to hear or what my logarithms want me to hear, all you hear is the same on on your side, near the twain shall meet. 
what do you do? Uh, how do you how do you re-engineer uh, the media, social media? It was fascinating to, to be precise. Um, when President Trump was banned, the reaction in Europe was mixed. Chancellor Merkel said, this is outrageous because you can't have a businessman deciding that you or me or Trump or someone else should not be allowed on Twitter. You need the government to do that. That's a governmental function. In, in America, it's not a governmental function. Do we need to change the ecosystem you described? Do we need to rethink that entire way of regulating uh, technology? Yeah, I think there, look, there are a number of uh, remedies that people are looking at and talking about, and that will only increase uh, after this experience on January 6th. I think there's a lot of uh, fervor out there to do this. But I would start this by saying there are no great solutions to this problem. And the reason is we also believe in freedom of speech. And we don't want anything that we do to really kill that. And that's the danger you run into with anything you want to talk about as remedies. Well, let me tick off some remedies. Uh, we used to have a fairness doctrine for the TV industry. Uh, and we used to require them to keep their license uh, to put on uh, opposing views to whatever views they were putting out. And when the Republicans won the Congress back in, in the 90s, they got rid of that. And it's never come back. And I, I dare say it would be hard to get it back. But that should be looked at as a possible partial solution. Secondly, people are all talking now about what to do about social media platforms. They're really media companies. They're not just dumb pipes and that they should be held to some standards, uh, maybe like the Fairness Doctrine or something else, standards of what is mostly true information and what is mostly untrue information. Certainly, most people would believe you, sh you shouldn't allow content on your platform that advocates violence or advocates killing people. Everybody can pretty much agree on that. But when you wade into whether or not we should have standards on the truth of the information or the untruth of the information, it gets really sticky and really hard, both with the First Amendment and their sheer ability to be able to do this, uh, to have en enough curators of the information in real time to make those umpire decisions. That's, that's a daunting task. There are billions and billions of posts on Facebook and YouTube and all these other uh, outfits. And, and that's going to be really hard, but it's something that we have to look at. Finally, you know, people talk about educating consumers of information, the people, to be more intelligent, effective consumers of information. And there are a lot of ideas floating around for how to do that. You know, some of it goes back to basic education of the population. Uh, having more people to have more effective education, that's a, that's a never-ending subject. And, uh, and, and trying to have civics taught in classes again and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of stuff here that's being talked about, but I would just caution everybody to understand the solutions are not clear. There's no silver bullets, and this is going to be a long, hard slog to get this thing where it needs to be. To the point, a recent Pew survey suggested that literally two-thirds of Republicans or Republican-leaning voters doubt, more or less, that Trump actually lost the election. Two-thirds. Now, some of my best friends are Republicans, so I must only know the one-third that accept reality. Uh, but two questions. One, do you think that's possible that two-thirds of, of more or less half the nation uh, doubt that Joe Biden is the legitimately elected president? And if so, how is that possible? How is it that that many people so distrust the, the institutions of democracy, the institutions of the media, that they're willing to say, I don't think this guy should be president? I not only think it's possible, I think it's probable. 
because when you look at the information culture that has been created, you can quickly and easily understand how people believe what their tribal leaders are telling them to believe. I have a lot of friends who are highly educated, very successful business people. And after the election, they many of them, many of them told me that they believed the election had been rigged, that there was massive fraud uh, by the Democrats. And, and so this is, is an indication of how far off the tracks we are. It alarms me when people who should be able to know better, who should be able to consume information more effectively, are just caught in the bubble, whether it's Fox or whether it's some social media thing they're stuck in or whether it's what their friends say to them. It is tribal politics. And I'll go back to what I said a minute ago. In part, we started to do this by doing it to ourselves. When politicians so disparage each other, the public doesn't know. I mean, if I say my opponent is a criminal and then he or she says I'm a criminal, they begin to think that all of us are criminals. There's no way for them to think otherwise. And they're barraged with these messages 24-7, 365. A lot of my friends watch Fox and the only channel they watch is Fox. That's where they get all their information. They cannot accept contrary information. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to know about it. They won't accept it. They think it's false. They think all of the media is corrupt. They think all politicians are corrupt. So we have brought this on ourselves. And if we don't figure out how to get back to a safer place, you can't have a healthy democracy without healthy information. It's critical. It's at the heart of the matter. One of the great ironies of this last election is the massive turnout. Literally two thirds of American voters went to the polls and voted, best since 1900 as a percentage. 160 million people voting. You've argued elsewhere that, and, and the facts would suggest it's true, that voting alone is not enough. And, and that we're clearly seeing that. This vote was a vote of anger, it was a vote of against things, but it was massive. Is that good or bad? No, it, it can't be anything but good uh, because, again, every citizen has a responsibility to participate in their self-government. And if they don't, my worry before the election was that people were just so bummed out about the whole system, they just wouldn't vote, that we wouldn't get anybody to vote. And then a lot of people had to vote by mail, which would be a big challenge. And they, they got through that and they did that. Uh, my son said to me the other day that maybe Trump's greatest legacy is he really got people to come back to participate in the democracy. Maybe he's right. Uh, but I, I just, I, I don't think we can count on having participation gauged by the amount of hatred and difficulty among all the people against each other. I mean, the Trump people came out and voted because they were so angry that that he was being attacked every day and that, that he wouldn't win and the election would be rigged. And so he, he had a massive turnout and he helped produce it. And I give him credit for that. I mean, they got a lot of people out to vote who had never voted. And the same on the other side. The question is, can we get out of these information bubbles and can we encourage people, as, as many are saying, to stop hating one another, to start respecting one another? There are a lot of efforts on that score. Uh, I've been part of a group called Braver Angels that structures citizen conversations around the country. They have chapters in every state. They do face-to-face -face meetings, or at least they did before the pandemic. Uh, and, and they really made strides. I mean, it always works. I mean, you get people in a room and get them to know one another and listen to one another, and you can break down a lot of barriers. It doesn't mean they're going to agree on anything, but at least they, they know they're citizens of the same country. 
they know they have some common values that they believe in, and, and it really changes the whole situation. But how many of those do you need to do? I mean, Facebook is out there, you know, 24-7, 365. So is Fox or MSNBC. I mean, everybody's pumping this stuff out day and night. I don't know how you can, you know, to me, the Braver Angels thing is kind of like spitting in the ocean. I mean, it's great, but what's the impact in the overall? Let's segue for a moment uh, back to Washington and particularly back to the Congress. Now, you served and led a Congress whose purpose was to govern, whose purpose was to produce laws. Um, we've gone a long way from that. The purpose of Congress for the last several sessions seems to be more to make noise than to govern, to confront rather than to collaborate. Uh, how can you recreate the conditions where legislative politics again becomes the art of the possible instead of the art of the noise? Well, this is kind of a two-sided issue. Um, it's very hard for the Congress to be other than a reflection of the American people. That's their job. That's why they're there. They're there to represent the public in their state, in their district. So if the public in their district is hating anybody on the other side and does not want to compromise on any issue that they care about with the other side, it's my way or the highway. It's very hard to begin to believe that Congress can go back to the way it was and the way it should be of, of being able to bring about compromises on complicated controversial issues. So that's my first answer. But there's another answer. There's another way of looking at this problem. And that is that no matter where your public is, where your constituents are, you are elected to be a leader, to use your judgment to make the best decisions you can make for the people you represent and for the whole country. I came from a district that was very evenly divided between Democrats and Republicans. And while we weren't as polarized then as we are now, I made a lot of votes, a lot of votes that half the people in my district hated, hated, and were offended about. But I did something else in my whole career that I think allowed me to get reelected in that atmosphere. And that is that in my entire political career, I did nothing when I went home and I would go home two, three times a month for long weekends. I did nothing but go door to door. I would go door to door and simply introduce myself, and ask people what they thought about what was going on in their neighborhood, in the community, in the state, in the country, and to get their beliefs, to get their thoughts. Still to this day, if there are any of my constituents alive today, if you went back to St. Louis and asked people about Dick Ephart, many of them would say, I didn't like any of his votes. I hated everything that he stood for and everything he did, but I always voted for him because he came to my door or to my brother's door. And I think he really cared about us. And he was trying to do what he thought was best, even though I disagreed with it for the district, for the state, for the country. I say that to say that when you're elected to Congress, you're not just to go there and, and live the good life and to be, you know, in the newspapers and the TVs and so on. You're there to lead. That's your job. Your job is to lead the people. And if you get unelected because of it, then fine. That's okay. That's part of the deal. Often I would say when I was trying to get votes of members uh, on tough things, they'd say, oh, you're right. We should do this. That's a good compromise we ought to do this, but I can't vote for it. And I'd say, why? And they'd say, well, they'll run ads against me on this and I'll get on, I'll, I'll lose. And I'd say, why did you come here? Why did you come here? Did you come here for this stupid job? Or did you come here to help the country? Now, let me end this little piece by saying I'm hopeful. 
I've met a lot of the young members in both parties in the Congress today, and I am impressed. This younger generation gets it, and they came there to, to get solutions done. You've got a group in the House and now in the Senate called Problem Solvers, and they are evenly split between D's and R's. And they came up, they were the basis of coming up with the last stimulus package that got done a, a few months ago, a few weeks ago. So Congress needs to be leaders. The members need to lead, and they need to lead from the bottom up, not the top down. They can't just look to the leadership. They need leadership, and the leadership has a pivotal role to play. But just like in their district, they need the solutions to come up through them to the leadership to get things done with compromises and in a bipartisan way. So I have some hope today that this part of the problem will be solved by the young people that have come to Congress. You formed, helped form an organization called Keep Our Republic, which advocates for much of what you've been talking about with me today that we need dramatic change to secure the future of democracy in the United States. You've talked a lot today about the information technology problem, which is universal and does need to be addressed. Are there other things besides some good example coming from the United States, which would help a lot? Are there other reforms that might improve our democracy? What might help others? Well, there are a number of pieces that I think can help. Uh, first, uh, we are, need to be focused on electoral reform. You can't have a democracy, I'll go back to what I said a minute ago, you can't have a democracy if people don't think the process is fair. They have to really believe that. And it really does have to be fair. And increasingly, for a lot of known reasons, uh, both sides have been attacking the process as unfair. Democrats say that Republicans are trying to suppress their voters and keep them from voting. Republicans believe that Democrats are rigging elections, that they're, you know, counting votes twice and on and on and on. And so we, we have broken people's trust, and I'm sure this is happening all over the world, in the electoral process. When I was leader in the House, I would always say process is everything. And people would look at me like I was, no one who cares about the process. I said, no, if people believe in the House and in the Senate that their process is unfair, then the whole thing blows up. So we need electoral reform. What does that look like? Well, we need to spend more money at the federal level on helping states and counties and cities have the infrastructure and the human talent that they need to run a big election. And it's hard. I have a friend who was Secretary of State of Missouri, and she says that the fact that we ever have a, an election that's successful is a miracle because of all the things that can go wrong. And now with mail-in ballots, absentee ballots, whatever you want to call it, trying to move to voting on computer and so on. I mean, this is an enormous challenge, and it takes money and effort. And, and one of the things that just knocked me out in this election, our KOR group was trying to help local jurisdictions have the talent and have the, the money they needed to do this. Private citizens contributed over $500 million to give straight to the states and local governments to help them with their election process infrastructure, to train poll workers, to be able to hire the talent, to have the machinery that they needed to really do this. So there's a long list of things in electoral reform. Let, let me move next to political reform. One of the reasons that so many people uh, mistrust the government is they think that special interests with money are controlling our government, that they pay for the representatives' campaigns, and then they tell them what, how to vote. And 
there's a lot of truth to that, unfortunately, because of Supreme Court decisions, because of the lack of Congress passing meaningful campaign reform, because of the First Amendment, which the Supreme Court has said uh, means, uh, you know, you can't stop how much money people put in, what they spend. Uh, we're in a bad place. We need, I think, almost radical campaign finance reform. My idea is to say to candidates, if you will restrict your fundraising only from individuals, $1,000 or less, uh, we will match every such contribution, dollar for dollar, with federal money. If you're running for Congress, running for the Senate, running for the presidency. So you would say to the public, okay, if you're offended that special interests own the government, then you need to pay for it. If you want to own something, you got to pay for it. And if you want to keep letting others pay for it and then complaining about it, stop complaining. Now, that would be a hard bill to pass, trust me. Uh, it is not a total answer because your opponent wouldn't have to agree to that. They could just keep raising the money the way they do, dark money, whatever. But the one thing that's given me hope on this subject is the amount of Internet or online fundraising in small dollars that goes on for both sides today. So I just want to enhance that to get more small dollar money into these campaigns if candidates are willing to restrict themselves to that funding and partial public funding, then they have to fend for themselves and try to beat the dark money. A final question. It's a complicated world. It's a mess. Uh, we both fear that democracy could be in a death spiral in our country and elsewhere. If you had a magic wand, you can only do one thing. What would you do? What would you wish for to secure our democratic future? It's a really good question, um, and I, you, you and I probably agree there are no magic wands, but I guess my optimism comes from my experience uh, that there is a magic wand, and the magic wand to me is the American people. Uh, I was in Congress for 28 years. I was on the city council in St. Louis for five years before that. Uh, I was a precinct captain in the second precinct of the 14th ward before that. Uh, I did nothing but go door to door. So I've met thousands and thousands and thousands of people. I ran for president twice. I spent literally two years on the ground in Iowa and New Hampshire, basically going door to door, going from farm to farm, from town to town and meeting millions of people. And then I, when I was running, I was in every state of the United States meeting thousands and thousands of people. No one is perfect. We're just human beings. But my firm belief is that the American people in a great majority are really good. They're not perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody fails. But they want the right things. They believe in the values of this country. They believe in what they have. They believe in the rule of law. They understand that you can't have capitalism without the rule of law, without democracy. It just doesn't happen. And so if I had to wave a wand, I guess I'd, I just somehow try to keep that belief in the American people. The really good news to me is that I think the young people in the country today really get this. I, I'm not altogether sure how they got it, but they've got it. And, and we just need to keep on keeping on. There's no magic answers. There are no magic wands. That, to me, is the underpinning of this great country. And I'll just end with this. So... Um, I grew up poor. Uh, my mom was a secretary. My dad was a milk truck driver. We had very little. Um, when I was a junior in high school, public school, St. Louis, 
uh, I had a speech teacher who stopped me one day after class. And she said, I think you could get a scholarship to go to the National High School Institute in speech at Northwestern. And I will help you fill it out. I had, it, it never entered my head to go to college. It was not in my view at all. My parents knew nothing about college. Neither of them had gotten through high school. So I filled out the stuff. I went to Northwestern. I wind, I'd never been out of St. Louis. I wind up in Evanston, Illinois. I walk on the campus of Northwestern with all these world-class debaters, extemporaneous speakers, poets, uh, just awesome people. I thought I had landed on Mars. I mean, I could not believe what I saw and what I heard. And then I got to go to Northwestern on scholarship. I got to go to Michigan Law School. America is opportunity for all. And I think people get that. And I think people will fight to keep that. Thank you. Thank you for that in particular. Maybe we'll call this episode, Everything Old is New Again, uh, or Needs to be New Again. Uh, thank you very much for what, what you've done over your career, Dick, and for what you're doing now, because neither of us want to see democracy in a death spiral. Uh, we can do better. And as you just pointed out, Americans want to do better. So let's find ways to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the New Thinking for a New World podcast. We welcome your comments on our website, talbergfoundation.org. And please subscribe to the podcast in the app of your choice. This podcast was made possible with the generous support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation.